Hello and welcome everyone to Nature Alive, the online show where we go behind the scenes at the Natural History Museum and meet the people that bring it to life. This week we're going to be going behind the scenes of the museum's latest science communication venture, the Wild Crimes Podcast. This new series delves into the shady world of the illegal wildlife trade, a business that is sadly booming around the world. From critically endangered eels stuffed into suitcases to caged chameleons at the heart of the exotic pet trade, millions of animals are dying at the hands of organized criminal gangs. My guests today were the hosts on the show and will be giving us a behind the curtain look, sharing their highlights of creating the series and taking your questions as well. I'm sure this topic will stir up a lot of emotions in some of you. So if you have any questions for us, please do pop them in the chat and we will try and get through as many of them as we can. My first guest today uh, will be a familiar face to many of you. He's been on many of these shows before. Uh, that is Khalil Thurley, fellow science communicator and Nature Online host. Thank you very much, Khalil, for joining us. How are you today? Hey, Alistair. Um, yeah, really excited to be in the guest seat for once. It's uh, it's a strange feeling. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's a different seat for you. I hope you'll behave uh, in your <laughs> in your position as speaker today. Uh, but it's lovely to have you here. I'm really looking forward to chatting to you uh, about the show. And, uh, and joining uh, myself and Khalil in conversation today is uh, evolutionary biologist and fellow science communicator, Tori Herridge. And uh, some of you may have seen Tori uh, from her uh, TV appearances in the UK, including series like Ice Age, Return of the Mammoth, Bone Detectives, uh, or Walking Through Time. Uh, so thank you very much, Tori, for, for joining us today. It's lovely to have you here as well. How are you? Oh, I'm good, thanks. Yeah, it's, this, is, this is nice. It's nice. This is my first Nature Live, I think since I got like 2010 or something so it's good oh gosh yes <laughs> yeah. and it'll be the first online one since we mm -hmm. used to do them uh, in the museum uh, in person well it's, uh, it's great to have you both here today so the podcast uh, let's let's talk about it now some of our our viewers may well have uh, have been listening to it um, but again a lot of them may not so this is a really great opportunity to kind of share some of the, the highlights and, and give us the lowdown on, on what it's all about but it's called Wild Crimes. Where did the idea come for a podcast like this? I mean, well, we've been kind of thinking about and, and kind of pushing for the, uh, the the idea of making a podcast for a while now. But I think, um, you know, the 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 shutdown of the of the museum for the for the COVID nineteen lockdown really made the move online a lot more kind of uh, a lot more important, um, and. Also, you know, it's a great way to to engage people, and so the the kind of the crime aspect, um, I think that was uh, that was mainly the, the brainchild of our of our friend and colleague Katie Katie Pavid, um, and the idea was that you know th these are really compelling stories, and the audience has to be the focus of anything we do when we're trying to communicate science. So we need something uh, we. We, you know, wildlife crime is something that can really grab our audience and and allow us to build up their relationship with nature as well as just having a compelling story to to follow. I think it's exactly right. Right, it's the brainchild of Katie Pavid, who is um, who's like the digital doyen. She has just done such amazing work over you know well, since she started, but the, I mean, literally the last two years in this pandemic period. It's been revolutionary, I think, for NHM Digital Comms. And yeah, this is her brainchild. We can't take credit for that. But it, it taps into something. The museum is so lucky, right? The museum's got this incredible offer already where people can connect with the scientists. You've got you, uh, say you, Khalil, yeah, your, your colleagues at Nature Live doing this amazing work already, right? So yeah, using a podcast, loads of institutions did podcasts in the pandemic, and they use them to do things the museum is already doing. Right, connecting with their like you know their 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 staff, their behind the scenes stuff. Right, the museum's got that already, like doing it really well. So this was a real opportunity to produce something which is effectively the equivalent of a really high end radio program. It's like mm -hmm. solid content. It's like detailed stories. It, it, it's really meaty stuff. It's great. It's different, and it, it's different to a lot of the other institutional podcasts that have come out over the last eighteen months. And um, mm -hmm. we obviously think it's the best because <laughs> it is, because <laughs> <laughs> it absolutely is. But you know, it, it was a really exciting opportunity. And Khalil's right; the crime aspect, I think, is key because it's more than just being like some kind of hook to get the punters in. Although it has that angle to it, right? You know, everyone loves a true crime podcast, but it's it's more fundamental than that, right? This is absolutely um, of interest to anybody 
who cares about what's happening with the planet at the moment. And one of the museum's focus right now is our exhibition, Our Broken Planet. It's one of our research focuses. And you know, what can we do to help avert the planetary emergency, the climate crisis, biodiversity challenges, right? It's, it's what can we do? And wildlife crime is a really interesting aspect of that because it's, first of all, not massively mentioned when it comes to things like the biodiversity issues and the climate crisis. But secondly, it's like a test case, right? So when was it, um, Cleo, when was societies? When was uh, 1975, I Yeah, right, 1975. The, the that Convention it, on the yeah. International Trade of Endangered Species of Fauna and Flora, <laughs> as we all <laughs> learned on the show. <laughs> so, yeah, it's really, really weird, isn't it? Because you use the term like CITES, it becomes a word, and you, can, you, go, and you go, what does it stand for? Like, oh, my yeah. God, <laughs> I don't know. But Khalil's <laughs> nailed it. Um, but, yeah, that, that was 1975, right? That was a, so it's a convention that effectively laid out the rules for wildlife crime, which species can and cannot be trafficked legally. And, yeah, and yet... Despite that being put in place in 1975, people are still poaching elephants, right? People are still collecting orchids illegally and selling them on the internet. So just having a convention, having a, um, a legislative framework for something doesn't necessarily fix it. And so yeah, the, the window that wildlife crime gives you onto ways in which you can avert a biodiversity crisis, a planetary emergency, you know, that in itself is really fascinating. And so we got mm. to tell these great stories. We got to hear about amazing plants and animals as well. And we, and alongside that, we got to interrogate the issues with finding solutions in a real yeah. world fashion. Yeah, and Tories mentioned those big wheels like international treaties, the UN, governments, corporations and stuff like that. But for to get those big wheels turning and to get change happening, you need the little wheels to turn as well. And so that means all of us, you know, we need to be pressuring these organizations and our and our leaders and, and our and, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And so we can't do that unless we know about it. So sharing this kind of understanding and, and building that that interconnectedness, I think is super important. Yeah, I bet yeah. we all know I bet we all know that elephants are on the CITES list, but I bet you couldn't name half the other species. And did you mean like some ridiculous, is it, what is it? Is it like 90% of the species on the list of orchids? Like it's a ridiculous number. Yeah. Like it's like ridiculous. So, you know, so you just, it's so, you know, it's, and that's the problem, right? So, you know, laws are one thing, but we all have, you know, it's, it's, it, there's always that argument, like ignorance is no defence when you're breaking the law. But actually it might not be a defence, but it is actually a fundamental thing that we need to know. Like it helps us understand, you know, it helps us understand whether we're doing something right or wrong. Like if you go on the internet and buy something, do you know? whether that's yeah. legal. Yeah, well, that's a really good point, actually, because I remember I was on holiday um, a few years back and um, walked into this, uh, we were on a, uh, it was a tropical island in, in Japan and we walked into a, a shop um, by the beach and they had loads of beautiful shells um, on display in the shop. And I was looking, they were absolutely stunning. And actually I recognized some of them from the from the museum and, and, and they were there for sale. And I was like, oh, I'd really like to get one. And then I was like, wait a minute though, I'm pretty sure I can't buy that or I shouldn't be buying that, you know, and, and like, it, it, but that awareness, not everyone would necessarily have that. You would just assume. It's or you could buy it, but not move, you could buy it, but not move it across borders. Maybe. I mean, yeah, there's like, so oh, maybe that. And, and again, and then you get, yeah. you get caught at, at customs or something and you didn't even realize that, 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 that nice shell you picked up is actually from an endangered animal. Um, so yeah. yeah, I think it's, it's, and it's, it's, it's really, um, it's great to kind of raise that awareness and, and, and it's very topical as well, because obviously a lot of people at the moment are talking about the climate emergency and climate change and natural disasters and all this stuff happening. And when you talk about the planetary emergency, I think that's what people think about, but actually we've got something here that, you know, this illegal wildlife trade has been made illegal for many, many years, for decades even, but it's still a problem. And I think there's a lot we could learn from why, why that is the case. Um, so both of you were um, hosts on the show, um, hosting together, but is it true you'd never worked together before you'd actually uh, hosted together? Is that true? It's true. Never again. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we hadn't. No, no, we hadn't. Actually, that's one of the great joys of you know, doing the podcast was meeting Khalil, I have to say. <laughs> yeah, it was really lovely, especially because, you know, um, in that in at the beginning of any collaboration or, or, or partnership there's always that period of kind of sounding out the person you're working with and kind of establishing a vibe especially if you're presenting together um but with tori it was really easy you know she's really easy to get on with she's enthusiastic she's knowledgeable um and i think also we we both kind of bring slightly different but complementary aspects to to how we interpret and approach the show so actually it was really easy yeah. 
And now we're married. <laughs> <laughs> Shh, that's meant to be a secret. <laughs> um, no, no, it was actually. You know, it's a great job. I mean, obviously, like you know, you don't get you don't get a gig like producing a podcast or hosting a podcast unless somebody you know, has heard you and thinks you're a decent communicator. So there was no doubt, like in my mind, that before I met Khalil, that he was going to be top notch, right? It's, the, it's it's obvious. But then the actual joy of actually meeting somebody who you can have a synergistic relationship with and who's a great collaborator it makes any project um enjoyable and when it's enjoyable it, it's always better it's always mm. better everyone goes the extra mile you know you, it's it just it flows naturally um but i have to say also we can't take full credit for this right we're the presenters and the presenters aren't everything they, they're very they're very much that the, the icing on the cake of a, of a production and so the one of the reasons why our relationship was you know so easy in some ways, is because we had these great producers. Mm -hmm. These great yeah. producers. There was like, you know, so there was Georgia Mills, there was James Tyndall. There was Rose Della Beatty, Dave Dodd, Steve Hankey, and yeah. Will Yates producing the, the series overall. And it didn't hurt that I'd already worked with Georgia as well. Um, in my first ever gig in science communication, we worked together on the, the Naked Scientist podcast. So it was really nice kind of uh, after a few years of, of working totally independently, coming back together on this project. Yeah, yeah yeah no that's that's really great and like when you when you hear your guys you, you clearly you know you you you've gelled really well there's a there's a lovely um rapport between between the two of you how did you get the tone right for the show because you're obviously dealing with really really quite serious they are very serious topics when we're talking about some of these <laughs> endangered animals that are being traded but equally you don't want it to be a, a downer you want people to want to tune in and listen and, and find out more so how did you kind of balance wanting to be kind of enjoyable to listen to but equally we're dealing with some pretty heavy stuff sometimes editing <laughs> <laughs> no no that's not true that isn't true Again, i mean it it's back. partly true yeah it is partly true <laughs> <laughs> all happens in the edit which hey, we well, can't do going out live right that, now. that is a big <laughs> part of the producer's work you know um you know we have six hours of conversation for some of these episodes and sculpting that down into a half hour narrative you know that that's mm. that's really important work also, oh, sorry, you, Tori, you were saying something. Oh, well, yeah, no, I mean, I think it's just reiterating. It is, like, again, like, we can take some credit. Like, we did uh, we did find our way through. I mean, it's like a like, challenge. I mean, I think, you know, it's a challenge to the audience, right? Listen to the episodes and see if you can order them from the ones that we recorded first to the ones that we recorded last, because the broadcast order is not the recorded order. And we learned as we were going through. And we found our feet, we found mm -hmm. our relationship. Because again, the first episode we recorded, we literally came cold to it. I mean, I think Khalil had one, and I had one Zoom chat. So we're, you know, we're meeting and getting to know each other and, and finding what the right tone is. So there is definitely yeah. that aspect to it. And maybe we didn't always get the right tone because both of us yeah. like a bit of a laugh. And sometimes, you know, you do like, nervously laugh about things that maybe are a bit serious. But then yeah. that's being human, isn't it? I mean, it's being no, human. That's it. Yeah, but then I think that's the producers. it's the producers. They they shaped it and they shaped the structure. And there's a mixture between me and Khalil having like some ridiculous chats and talking about Khalil's pet hyena in his garage, <laughs> which happens <laughs> one day. <laughs> one day, never mind. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so there's that. That that is then balanced with the kind of slightly more serious, solid expert led content from our contributors. And there are some, yeah, there are some like lighter moments there, but you don't mess with. You can't make jokes about some things that are really, really, mm -hmm. really, really mm -hmm. important and tragic. Yeah, 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 and I, on, in terms of uh, Tori's challenge to the listeners to, to guess which one we made first, yeah, put it in the chat um, if you guys are listening and you've what you've listened to the show and you, you have a feel free to put put the numbers episode numbers in the chat and we'll see if you get it right. So as as a little hint, um, I think we started off kind of with quite a professional vibe uh, in terms of our, <laughs> our, you know, in terms of our, in terms of our, like, I'm really terrified style. now. <laughs> like there weren't and then, ones. Then it, and then, you know, as we were finding our feet and getting more comfortable with each other, it became a much, much more personable vibe and it became much more of a chat um, and rather than a, a kind of a work discussion. Mm. Yeah, no, that's, and, and did you find that, obviously uh, it will not have um, uh, passed anyone by, that you were recording all this during a global pandemic. Did that present any particular challenges i guess a lot of stuff was being done remotely whereas maybe you would have wanted to be in person for yeah only the last episode was ever recorded in an actual professional recording studio all the rest of it was recorded you know in my bedroom or my living room if my neighbors were being too noisy with their power tools in tori's attic <laughs> um, <in> my loft. <laughs> yeah and you know calling our guests all around the world so 
it was it was quite DIY a lot of it um, mm. until that last episode. And it was very nice to be in a proper recording studio at last. <laughs> <laughs> I literally had to go up a ladder just to stop my children from interrupting. <laughs> It's like you can't climb up here. <laughs> Close <laughs> the hatch right. behind you. Yeah. Totally. It's like ba ding. <laughs> yeah. But um, then you like, just start cooking in your in your loft. I'm sitting in my in my attic yeah. in uh, you know, I used to carry yeah. I used to carry a duvet up with me just for extra, extra hot sweatiness. <laughs> it's gonna help deaden the yeah. sound. I'd come Making up a little sound booth out of a duvet in the middle of summer. <laughs> It was like some oh. kind of reverse Father Christmas, carrying it, going up the ladder with this kind of thing over my shoulder and my and my task cam between my teeth or something like that to get it. So we had these things called task cams, which you record onto, which is also a learning curve because the first couple of episodes, you might you might be able to feel a hint for guessing which one's which. If Khalil and I are absent from an interview, it might be because we forgot to hit record on our task cams. <laughs> <laughs> There you I, go. I, I may have science. done that at one point. <laughs> <laughs> wow, you're really letting well, the curtain slip this time, Tori. Well, like, regular well, viewers of Itch Live will know there was there's been at least one show where I've uh, I've gone live and been on mute. So you know, I think we've all been there at some point yeah. during a pandemic as well. Um, so let's talk a little bit about um, about some of the, the stories because there must be some. There's loads of stories that you cover uh, throughout the throughout the show, and we, we won't talk about all of them here. We don't have time for that, but there must be some highlights for you. Uh, Khalil, I wonder if I could start with you. Was there a particular story that really s resonated with you that, that's a highlight for you? Yeah, I'd say, um, well, because throughout most of the most of the episodes, the stories are very international because a lot of this inter like wildlife crime is international. Um, but it kind of felt at some points like all, all this was happening over there. You know, it was, oh, ch demand in China fueling... Uh, crime in Africa and it going through all these other places but it never felt like we were really you know looking at our own house um and so the episode about killing birds of prey to preserve the, to to keep grouse more as profitable I think that was really quite powerful for me because you know it was acknowledging that you know this this stuff happens at home as well and looking at the the, you know the class interactions and the and the inequalities and power dynamics within that as well i think that was it was a really satisfying set of conversations to have mm. I yeah really... i think that's uh, sorry go on Tori. no i just thought, i just wanted to add that there in that particular episode i thought was really interesting because in some ways it was a real okay, another insight into what happens at the end of the process with biodiversity loss so in some ways it's a crime wrapped to crime but we're dealing with an environment in the uk which has already lost a lot of its biodiversity its megafauna and so this is what you end up with uh, yeah so it's kind of it that's the end game of some of the plate some of the strategies that are in place or the procedures and processes that are going in place in in parts of our world which have not been as damaged yet um do they want to end up like a managed grouse moor Mm. And the problems that, that entails, which I think is quite interesting as well. I, mean, I find yeah. that really fascinating to look at that, yeah, that other end of the scale, and also to kind of compare, like, you know, domestic crime to these transnational crimes, because like the hen harrier, which was, you know, one of the birds of prey most persecuted in the UK on these grouse moors, is not a CITES listed species, and yet the UK has recognised mm. that any raptor persecution is a crime because we value those birds. Right, and so it's kind of so you so you can value something at a local level that isn't necessarily you know, endangered at a global level, and that's still important and still valuable and valid. Yeah, yeah, no, that's uh, yeah, really, really good points, and I think certainly for it's interesting for uh, viewers in the UK, particularly because I think wildlife crime, I think we initially do think of it as something that's a kind of a foreign problem. It's something that's a big issue in parts of Asia or Africa. Mm -hmm. Um, and the UK as a country as well, it's countryside, it's, it's even what we think of as um, kind of untouched countryside is, is rarely the case in, in the it's UK. Very it's, it's, it's very touched. It's very, very managed part of, you know, we're a relatively small island and, um, you know, that land has been changed and cultivated and built on for, for hundreds of years. There's, there's Even in the remote areas, it's not as uh, untouched as, as you might think. So, yeah, some really, really interesting points there. Um, so yeah, thanks for that, Khalil. Uh, Tori, did you have any um, any any highlights yourself? Oh, it's so hard because it is, you know, it's I, I learned so much, so much during this series. It was it was a real, like, a, a really fun like learning experience for me, as well as kind of quite a powerful journey. Is a cliche, but it really was a bit of a journey. Um, but you know, so it's, it's really actually kind of linked to the same topics that are 
we're in the, the rat to persecution episode because that's just a kind of form of, of wild game hunting. And I found the episode on primates, which is what it's titled in the in the list, absolutely um, incredibly, incredibly interesting because it we touched there on the issue of bushmeat. So it's called primates as the episode, but actually the topic covered in some detail is is hunting. Um, animals for game in the Congo Basin. So that's the colour category what bushmeat comes under, but basically it's just wild game from West African Congo Basin. Mm -hmm. and, and, and all the topics there were so like, so multifarious. We started off the episode trying to consider it from a pandemic perspective and the risk of zoonotic events. Uh, it went full circle and came back to a general conservation argument. But because, yeah, because, you know, because there was no single one issue that it could really be drawn out as the key driver there because they were so interlinked. And I think that's really interesting in all of these aspects of these wildlife crime topics is it seems like a simple question. We want to save this species. It's being poached or hunted or in other ways endangered by illegal trade. Um, let's stop the illegal trade. But actually, the problem driving it is usually multifactorial and very different in different cultures and countries, different legislations across the board in different places. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, and so because of that, it lends itself to different solutions. So I came, you know, started up being interested as a pandemic risk at the point, you know, because of course we, you know, we've been hearing about it a lot during the last 18 months, these zoonotic events. Um, but during the process of researching it, I actually became less convinced of the, you know, the kind of the pandemic risk danger from the Congo Basin and more worried, actually. I, I, felt, I felt the pressing issue really for, for bushmeat poaching it ultimately in, like right in the next five, 10 years is the biodiversity and conservation risk. But it cannot be discounted. The pandemic risk intersects with that. And so when they're intersecting, then, it, you know, it becomes something which we all need to sit up and take take um heed of and yeah. no one is like no one is because wildlife crime is not is like it's not the poor relation of other international crimes right mm. and so it's not really being monitored in the same way we don't really have a handle on how much like bush meat's being moved around the world and so without that data yeah it, it, we can't really say like here's the scale the problem like yeah there's x number of potential zoonotic events there's x number of potential movements of a to b if we could have those numbers then we get a sense of whether it's a problem or not we don't know mm. don't yeah know there's so much know. still still to be we just don't know. And, it, and sometimes it's we may never get that data because uh, because so much is kind of shaded because you know there's, there's a lot of illegal dealings going on and things people don't want to talk about it don't want to publicize stuff it becomes a really tricky thing to to to, to sort of investigate and, and dissect yeah and so, i yeah, also, really, got, really and I also got to and i also got to ask ben garrett what chimpanzee tasted like <laughs> uh, i wonder what it tastes like uh pork apparently he didn't eat it i hasten to add okay <laughs> he, yeah he asked, he asked a colleague <laughs> yeah asking for a friend yeah right um well we've had a couple of questions coming in from viewers so i'm going to just pause for a moment and we'll we'll we'll, we'll, we'll take these so um the first one uh, is a question from from andrew now I, I don't know if you guys will be able to answer it uh see what you think but um, andrew's asking um it's possible to buy plant seeds from all over the world on ebay uh, they could be acting as a vector for anything are those sales legal um, do you guys know anything about that? Because okay, you can get anything on eBay, but um, yeah. My, gen my general seeds. reaction is, if you're not sure, don't buy it. Because I don't yeah. know. Yeah. I mean, and it's, it's quite, and that's one of the issues. I mean, I remember you, Khalil, you had that interview with the um, one of the experts in the orchid episode, who she looked at with you at stuff on on eBay, and she struggled, didn't she, to be one hundred percent sure? And she's an expert on orchids. Yeah. I mean, if you've got anything that you're not sure about, then you know you can email it into the to the museum and and they can pass it on to to someone who might be able to answer that for you but again you know these things are notoriously difficult to unpick so yeah i agree with tori if you're not sure um and you can't get an answer out of an expert then i'd say leave it well alone because yeah, yeah. yeah it's it's not really worth the risk if you're bringing hey, in you know it could be endangered species it could be like 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 andrew said carrying some kind of um pathogen or disease that that can spread um or a new type of pest so yeah, yeah. I, i'm not sure you want to roll those dice but Try yeah, the do, 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 do email do email that question in um to to the museum there's, i think there's a, an address on our website and they'll yeah, be able to yeah. pass that on to the right curator yeah no that's that's a good good question i think the uh, if in doubt don't don't bother uh, is is uh, is a good good course of action another question uh this one's coming from noah uh, age seven they're asking what is the most endangered animal that is hunted 
Mm. That's a good question. Do we do we know the answer to that? That's well, how do you the most trafficked mammal is humans. Um, the second most trafficked mammal is pangolins, mm. um, which is episode one of the podcast. Spoilers. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but they're not the most endangered, are they, yet? No. They're on the red list, some of them, and some of them, some species are still not. I mean, I, I guess mean, you could say there's, there are very few. Well, I mean, for instance, rhino, I would yeah. say. Yeah, the, the, the there's rhino. one subspecies of, mm -hmm. of white rhino that only has two adults left and they are both female so mm. that is very rare and gonna get rarer because they yeah. can't really reproduce naturally and then there are the species so in the reptiles episode which is really interesting is that yeah there are these kind of sort of there are species that are just being discovered right so they've literally just been discovered so maybe only one or two individuals are known about and they're yeah and the reason why they're only just been discovered is because they are rare <laughs> So mm -hmm. there could be a huge other number of them around. And within six months of discovery, once that discovery has been reported in the literature, people have found them and are trafficking them. So I would say that would come under the same category. There might be only one or two or three known individuals of one species. And yet within six months, somebody who just desperately wants one as a pet because they cannot bear to not have what they want right now, like some selfish toddler, will go and will pay somebody to find it for them. So, you know, you don't, thing, be it? there, 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 it's this risk. tragic thing that humans value rarity. You know, the rarer an animal or a plant is, the more somebody somewhere desperately wants it and will go to any length to try and get it, either to keep it as a pet or display it in their home or, or whatever it is that they want to do. It's, yeah, yeah it's just, it's a real. It's a real tragedy. The rarer is, the more, the more everyone's we want it. in a golem, like, oh, my precious. You know, it's like it's precious <laughs> and therefore wanted. And it's like, it's, and that's a real fundamental aspect of human nature. And it comes back to like, you know, people, we, and we all have it. And so we have to recognize it in ourselves. It's not like some massive moral failing. We all have it. We all like to mm. own things. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. it's just it's just about like, you wanted to buy those shells, Alistair, because you'd like them. Like they're beautiful. You wanted them. And I so did. it's just about asking yourself, yeah, everyone does. It's, it's natural. It's where, that's where culture comes from. The beauty and art comes from it's this desire to kind of encapsulate and surround ourselves with beautiful wonderful interesting things it's where the desire to study things come from it's yeah. like you know it's like it's it's why museums exist well that's it yes museums <laughs> collect things but yeah although of course we don't have time to go into it today but of course the way modern museums collect is very different to how it used to be uh, and for good reason now we're, we're running out of time and i've got a couple of things i want to ask you guys and i know we've got a few more questions from you guys online so we'll try and get to those in just a minute but i do want to ask you both you know you covered so much in the series and folk can can download and and, and listen to, uh, to to these episodes but there's a thread running through all of it isn't there what is it that kind of brings a lot of these individual stories that you covered? What is it that brings all of this illegal trade together? Because there's a lot of, sort of underlying behaviors and things, isn't there? I think I'm looking at you. Because she knows I'm looking what I'm at you, say. <laughs> <laughs> She knows what I'm gonna say. Can I say it? One word, uh, capitalism. Um, <laughs> it's, it is this whole thing of, and we've just been talking about how humans love rarity and special things. Um, and it becomes this supply and demand thing. You know, we want something, um, so we, we get a lot of it. And then that thing becomes rarer. And that means that each one that is left is worth more. And so there's more incentive to hunt the last ones um, or to smuggle the last ones, whatever, whatever organism we're talking about. Yeah, Michele and Menegon. So, Michele Menegon, then the Menegon in our reptiles episode, who's this, he's a conservationist who works for PAMS, which is an African conservation charity that supports the Tanzanian government in their wildlife crime efforts. He put it really well. He's like, business is really, really efficient business is really efficient and making things happen quickly so it's not mm. just capitalism might be the fundamental but it's also a really efficient mechanism the capitalism mechanism of, of of getting rid of stuff quickly if you want something you will get it fast there's a business reason for it and mm. so and that's uh, that, that is way faster than the wheels that turn in conservation or science business does things quickly quicker than we can yeah. respond sometimes yeah, no, that's, that's that's a real challenge, and I think yeah, if you if you, if you listen to the episode, you, you'll you'll probably naturally start to piece together these these common threads, and and it's like it's all very well, I guess, if you want to go and kind of protect one species that you really care about and try and help in that way, but actually there's there's a deeper problem that really, as as Khalil says, capitalism. <laughs> and, uh, but that's quite, a, that's quite a big one to deal with. Uh, yeah, well, but, right. Yeah. And I would say don't. I mean, that's just it. So that is the big thing, right? But don't. So it's like, you know, you don't feel that because that might be this common thread that draws it together. I don't think there's any doubt about it. It doesn't mean that you have to overthrow capitalism to make a difference, right? Don't mm. give up on the small things. That might be the ultimate goal. 
all right but you know you don't you don't get derailed from doing mm. that one thing you want to do to say the species that you love because the yeah. other thing that I think becomes really clear about this many faceted and complex problem is that rather than that being an overwhelming aspect, the fact that biology is complicated, humans is compli are complicated, economics is complicated, they, rather than seeing that as a problem, what that seems to me to indicate is there are many different ways in and many mm -hmm. different ways to make a difference that in aggregate might, might be enough. And then yeah, there's and can happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you know, because I, I know that, I know that you know the, the the mechanisms of of capitalism that got us into these problems are not necessarily going to get us all the way out of these problems, but we still do need to use those mechanisms um, to, to to in the meantime to try and change the system that we're working in. Yeah. Um, and I think I referenced that in the uh, philosophical quote that I end the last <laughs> episode with. Anyone who hasn't seen the episode uh, or listened to the episode, go and listen. It's um, it's from a, some, a group of very wise people that we could all learn a lot from. <laughs> yeah, go check that out. If anyone has, has listened and knows what uh, Khalil's referring to, pop it, pop it in the chat. Right, we're, <laughs> we're just about out of time, but um, I, I had one last question. I'm going to roll it in actually to a question from one of our viewers. My question was going to be, um, would you like to do a, a season two? Because there's clearly more that you'd, you'd love to talk about. And uh, we had a question from Lauren, so it links us. Do you guys have any plans to cover the butterfly selling or smuggling that's occurring currently, especially that of the blue morpho species. So yeah, I guess there's probably loads more you could talk about. There was going to be a butterflies episode, but it got we ended up going for raptors in the end because we felt we'd missed it on the UK aspect. But no, totally. I mean, there's so many, so many different stories to tell, not to mention the bigger, broader crimes against the natural world that we haven't covered. Okay, like, you know, mm -hmm. sort of you know, there's a basic ones. You know, we didn't the tim we haven't done illegal timber. We haven't done um, you know, oil, the spills. Basic oil spills, river pollution. Mm -hmm. You know, there's these really big fundamental things that, you know, arguably creating like, you know, bigger issues than some of the sort of individual trades in wildlife, which are more mm. like, the, sort of like the canary in the coal mine uh, yeah. aspect of the things. So, I mean, no, totally, there's so much more scope. I mean, yeah, yeah. When I saw Lauren's question come up in the chat, I did uh, just add it to the doc I have open in another tab, which is a list of topics that I really, really would like to us to, to do if we do a second series. But if you do want a second series on the subject of supply and demand, um, if you listen, if you, if you guys at home listen to it, you leave positive reviews, share it with your friends, the more people uh, listen to it, the more chance we have to make a second series for you guys. Um, yeah. Or just bug the museum about it enough. <laughs> yeah, they love that. Yeah, so, 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 like if you do want that, just yeah, made myself just... really popular with our PR. <laughs> you, you've got to ask for it. But yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I, I'm sure even if it weren't in a podcast, some of these issues are going to come up in things like Nature Live and other events that we do because mm -hmm. it really is, um, it really is hot topic stuff that we that we want to be engaging with. All right, folks. Well, unfortunately, we have run out of time uh, today. Um, it's been fantastic talking to to both of you, Tori and Khalil. It's it's really um, it's just great to to talk about this stuff with you and get that insight into the show. And I'm sure um, for folks that have listened to the show, it's been a really nice sort of behind the scenes look. But if you haven't listened to it yet, I'm sure this has uh, encouraged you to go and at least check out a couple of episodes and uh, and and see what you think. But uh, yeah, thank you both so much for, for joining me today and, and and all the best with your your future endeavors. Um, I'll be looking forward to seeing them seeing them really soon. But thanks both. Thank you. And thank you guys as well for uh, for joining us today. It's been lovely having you. Thank you very much for your questions as well. Hopefully, we've given you a deeper insight into the series. And if you've let down, uh, if you've yet to download it, then head on over uh, to wherever you get your podcasts uh, and have a listen. Uh, we'll also put some links in the chat uh, that you can follow uh, to download it for yourself. But uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Next week, uh, Khalil will be back in the host's chair as he takes a trip to explore the biodiversity of isolated mountains, so-called islands in the sky. But until then, thank you very much for joining us and we'll see you next time.